So, herzlichen Glückwunsch mit Ihrem 100. Jahr. Also, not only on behalf of the Frisky Academy, but also from the Mercator uh, European Research Center on Multilingualism and Language Learning, which is a part of our institute. The Frisian standard is historically, uh, or Frisian is historically a sister language of English. However, for five centuries, Frisian has been overwhelmed by its big brother Dutch. So, and the Frisian uh, standard is in fact an attempt attempt to create an independent language in its own right. So this is our roadmap of my talk. Uh, we start with the sister of English, Old Frisian, then a period of slumber with Middle Frisian, resurrection uh, uh, from the 19th century onwards, recognition from the 1950s, and then I will focus on Frisian today and confront you with some challenges for the future. So, sister of English, Old Frisian, let's say 1200 until 1500. Uh, we had the migrations of Anglos, uh, Saxons and Frisians from the Germanic Danish coasts to the Dutch coasts and to England. And uh, as you will see in a minute, uh, they form a kind of uh, subgroup. Uh, but here the, you see that the Frisian area was much larger than it will be today. Uh, so it's uh, all along the coast from the south of Denmark until the west of the Netherlands, not until the uh, France, unfortunately. And I had decided to put my chrono, but it's... Um, well, let's look at the language families. Um, here you have, let's go back, uh, the West Germanic uh, branch, where you make a, a, a division between Anglo, Frisian, and Netherlandic Germanic uh, branch. So, Netherlandic or Dutch and German are brother and sister, and English and Fr Frisian are, in fact, brother and sister. And when you look into this Anglo Frisian branch a bit more in detail, uh, uh, you, in fact, have to say when you go from old to middle or, or uh, over mod to modern Frisian that you have three Frisians. So there's not one Frisian, there are three Frisians. West Frisian, East Frisian, and North Frisian. And I will mainly talk about West Frisian, but we'll come back to that. So this is this Frisian speaking area, uh, where in dark blue over here, there is the West Frisian area. That's my, our Frisian. I'm not Frisian, I'm Belgian. Uh, <laughs> So here is East Frisian, also known as Sater Frisian, about 10,000 speakers. And here we have North Frisian, so uh, near Denmark, uh, north of Germany, about 2,000 speakers. We have about 450,000 speakers, 650,000 inhabitants. Now, when you look at old Frisian texts, we mainly have uh, law texts. There are a couple of religious texts, some historical texts, some administrative texts, but amazingly, no literary texts at all of old Frisian. And uh, there is no evidence, in fact, of, for, uh, of the conscious creation of a kind of old Frisian spelling, pronunciation, or grammar norm in that old Frisian period. It's very early, of course. Limited elaboration was found, in fact, by the extension from the legal genre, which was the original one, towards chronicles and administration in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. But old Frisian soon almost died. Uh, uh, the well of old Frisian municipal charters runs dry and is replaced with texts municipal charters in Dutch uh, by the end of the 14, yeah, 1450s, 1460s. It starts already. Uh, your language fled to plow and cow, so it became a farmer's language from the countryside. Let's go to the second period already, slumber and resurrection. <coughs> so, we blame the, Sp the Spanish. Loss of independence after 1498 and 1572. 
Uh, uh, so there was a union against Spain in the Low Countries. There was a weak self-conscious, a weak self-consciousness, a weak Frisian identity. The cultural distance to Holland, uh, the provinces, the, the, the Dutch, as they call now, are small. And also the linguistic distances are small. You cannot compare them, uh, the distance between uh, Basque and Spanish. And the old Frisian writing tradition was very limited, as we just saw. There's a first wake-up call in 1666 by Gisbert Japix, Gijsbert Jacobs in Dutch. He wrote a book in Frisian consisting of poems, letters, dialogues, stories, and translations of psalms, and, the, and even a philosophical uh, treatise. He's in fact the counterpart of Bernard Echepare. So here you see Gijsbert Jacobs, or in Frisian as we call him, Gisbert Jacobs, and the literary prize in Frisian is called the Gisbert Japix Prize. The written language in the 18th century was kept alive by a trickle of mostly incidental poems, some uh, psalm translations, and two very entertaining novelesque plays recently re-edited by my colleague Erik Hoekstra, and that's the nice cover of his book. So there's no standard in middle uh, Frisian. And the writings of this period uh, are completely break with the old Frisian orthography. Uh, and uh, there's much more variation in middle Frisian than in old Frisian. Uh, and the orthography is very much inspired by the Dutch orthography. What kind of genres do we have at that time? Well, these are literary uh, texts. So there they are, religious texts, entertainment but no legal text anymore, no administrative text, no scientific text at all, although there was at that time a university in the Free Islam province. So no norm, no dictionary, no grammar. What we were lucky at that time. <laughs> so let's go to resurrection in the 19th century. The Frisian language, in fact, reawoke in the Romantic age like so many other languages. And at the end of the 19th century, we saw the creation of a norm, a spelling, and a grammar. But in order to tell you the battle of the orthographies, yes, they are everywhere, we first uh, point once more to these three Frisian languages, uh, one in the Netherlands and three uh, in Germany, and we just saw them already, so let's go on. Here in this map, you see how reduced the Frisian language area was. So the ordinary gray, and now, the, yeah, here is light. Uh, so this was the whole Frisian area, and what is left is here, West Frisian, over there, North Frisian, and a little bit of East Frisian over here. So what happened to these areas? Well, all kinds of contact dialects arose with Frisian substrate. Uh, so there's a Dutch dialect called West Frisian, but it's a Hollandic dialect just above Amsterdam. The Groninger dialect is a mixture uh, uh, of low Saxon, but there are still some Frisian elements in it. There is town Frisian, uh, so the urban Frisian, uh, which is Dutch with some Frisian influence in it. Important to know also is that these three Frisians, uh, West, East and North, they are not mutually intelligible anymore. Uh, so, and all three are fully recognized as minority languages by the European uh, uh, Council. So let's skip this. Standardization. It was, in fact, Harman Sietstra who proposed the Great Frisian spelling for the three languages based on old Frisian. So this idea, let's unite them again. And he even reintroduced cases and verbal conjugations of old Frisian. So we had the battle of the orthographies between, at the one hand, Harman Sietstra, who 
propagated this unified, extremely archa archaic, artificial and unreadable spelling system. And then uh, a more modern one, closer to spoken language, just slightly uh, uh, archaic by uh, Joost Halbertsma at uh, the left-hand side and uh, uh, Waling Dijkstra. And these Halbertsma, there were even two brothers, uh, Joost and Eeltje, they wrote a large collection of stories, poems, and also some pro frisian scientific articles uh, and magazine articles very well written and humorous at the same time. Not the, best, not the most common characteristic among Frisians, I have to say. But this Joost, he was a linguist and he experimented with the spelling. Uh, so, and first he opted to stay as close as possible to contemporary pronunciation. Uh, but later on in his life, the war lasted for 30 years, that's the orthography war. Uh, uh, he advocated spelling variants motivated by being old, well, and as a consequence, a bit less readable. Waling Dijkstra, uh, he was a popular writer too, who was very popular, uh, very prolific, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, he worked with Halbert Sma together to propagate this uh, uh, spelling, which was ultimately uh, adopted after three decades of discussion. So it took them some time. And it's at that period, end of the 19th century, that we have a first partial dictionary in Latin uh, by Halbert Sma, and the first complete prison dictionary uh, by Walling Dijkstra, we uh, named him already, was in Dutch. Otherwise, no one could read it. Practical grammars in 1902, and even a first grammar in English in 1913. There was already at that time high dialect tolerance. Why? Well, in fact, there is not that much dialect differentiation in Frisian. Uh, but the clay, the so-called clay dialect, has had the largest influence on the norm. Uh, but also elements from the uh, three other dialects were accepted as long as they were different from Dutch. That's important. Be different from Dutch. And at that time, we see also uh, this increase of Frisian literature uh, that we hadn't had before. Uh, and there's a high production of plays. Uh, every village at that time had a drama society, and they were doing plays in their mother tongue, being Frisian. And until, folk, until 1920s, the focus on, in the literature is mainly on entertainment. Uh, it's from the 1920s onwards that we see the so-called highbro literature. Several works were translated, uh, the, the Bible, uh, Shakespeare, and even uh, Homer, Nietzsche, Rilke, Gide, and some of the works were even translated by my colleague Erik uh, Hoekstra. Now, how does it continue, uh, by, or what's the state of affairs by 1900? We have the first codification of spelling, a first dictionary, a first grammar, Frisian courses start to be given, Frisian plays entertainment. So that's the state of affairs uh, in 1900. But it was prohibited, Frisian was prohibited, in all official public domains. So not in government, not in justice, not in education. So let's move on to the 1900s and 1950s. What are the milestones in this period? Well, the first one is 1907, when the Provincial Council supports Frisian lessons after school hours. In 1928, AFUC, the General Committee on Education in Frisian, is founded, and also a provincial educational board. And in 1937, there is a national law allowing language education in a regional language in living use. They don't mention the name Frisian. In 1938, our institute is founded. 
with only small government funding, and in 43, well, uh, the complete Bible is in French. So that's also very symbolic in a very religious area where language of religion, in fact, always had Protestant religion, has been Dutch in the Netherlands. So what's the aim of the Frisk Academy? It's much broader than your academy. Uh, the foundation's aim is to maintain a working community dedicated to practicing science in relation in Frieslam, the Frisian people and its culture in all its manifestations and in the broadest sense of the word. We have researchers, a lot of support staff, study groups on topics that we don't even have scientists, because our scientists are mainly on language and history at this moment, but for instance we have a, a study group on musicology or on agriculture. We have nominated members, more, by, more than 300, because becoming a member is kind of assurance to get a long life. So a lot of our members are over 80. And it's the same for our contributors. Uh, our contributors, I think the average, average age is about 70 to 75, which is a problem, I think that we cannot reach the young Frisians. So recognition from the 1950s until now. Well, this was a very symbolic event in 1951. That's, uh, in fact, the only day they really fought for Frisian. Uh, it was on the occasion of a court case around the Frisian, and so then uh, the police had to intervene, or had to, the police intervened violently. And I want to point you out to a detail. This picture was sent to me, Tommy. Dutchmen, go home. They protest already in English uh, at that time. <laughs> uh, new milestones. First bilingual schools in 55. Frisian allowed as language of instruction in years one uh, to three of primary school. Uh, two years later, official recognition of Frisian that it can be used in school and in court. First, a couple of years later, first radio broadcasts. And in 1970, there is a small recognition as second official uh, language, but it, for me, it's a lot on paper. In 1980, Frisian uh, becomes an obligatory course in primary school, a course, not language of instruction. And there are lots of ways to get rid of it. So lots of exceptions po uh, possible. Um, let's skip a couple of them and go to 95, uh, when Frisian becomes accepted as language of administration next to Dutch. Oh la la, that's going uh, far. <laughs> and so in 2014, um, well, we have the Wet Gebruiken Friese Taal, so that's really the official recognition. Now, the province, uh, province does a lot of efforts to promote Frisian in all kinds of things. So let's go to Frisian today and some results of language surveys. There has been language surveys in the past. Uh, the first one in 69, uh, one in uh, 84, and then the uh, third one in 30, 95. And by someone you probably, most of you know, Der Korter. Well, uh, who works here in the Basque country. And um, some results, mother tongue. 48% of the Frisians have Frisian as mother tongue. And in fact, it's more than 60% if we include the bilingual Frisian Dutch and those with Frisian and a uh, regional language. Um, home language, well, what do we see here? that there is a decrease of Frisian uh, between 69 and the 80s, but then it remains stable. Uh, it's around 50% as a home language. Language skills. Well, what do we have to remember from this slide? Listening and speaking are quite good, but here, look at reading. Uh, uh, 30% in 95, but especially writing. 12% in 69, 2 in 84, uh, and 4% in 95, and ooh, 18% now. Hooray, hooray. Perhaps less hooray. 
but because who is doing this writing? Well, look here. Who writes every day? People under 30. Let's be happy. But what do they write? Well, they mainly write WhatsApp and SMS. And look at official letters. It remains very small. Also, the old generation, only 12% of the old generation says, well, I every now and then write an official letter in, in Frisium. So, it's a spoken language. Writing is not uh, very popular, although all these efforts. This is some things about language change. I'm going to skip these. But we also looked at uh, variation in uh, word choice, uh, for instance. And what we see here, when there are competing forms, here we see uh, there are, Amtner is the real Frisian word, Amtenaar is the Dutch loan. And you see even that L1 speakers of Frisian use more the Dutch loan than second language learners. So, language courses learn you the purest word, the other ones not. Uh, let's skip this one uh, and uh, have a look at here uh, to see. Uh, in fact, this is the word for Saturday. Uh, there are two competing Frisian forms, uh, snoon, which is the most popular one uh, in the clay area, and Saturday, which is the really the wood frisian form, but you also see that Snoen shows up there. But also a new Dutch loan starts showing up, Saturday. Uh, it's still infrequent, but you see it's uh, showing. So there's a lot of lexical variation, as you can see, for all these things. And the story is very often the same. Hey, it sounds more, it becomes more and more in Dutch, but every now and then there are uh, new Frisian forms uh, showing up. So we developed with provincial support a lot of digital tools uh, and we deal uh, with variation in a kind of uh, uh, modern way by not being too prescriptive uh, but being proscriptive. Uh, so these are some of our things. I'll, we have a standard word list and when you see uh, what are these criteria for a standard word list, it are the same ones that you have heard already in other talks. Uh, we don't have to repeat them, uh, but distance to Dutch is a criteria. But in our tools, we suggest a standard word, but we always say you can use your own dialect word. Uh, and, or you can say this is a Hollandic word, and uh, uh, so uh, we use a lot of variation. Um, but I'll, I'm going to take uh, two more minutes. Uh, we have a machine translator uh, doing things. We are making a new dictionary, online dictionary. I would like to talk to the people here about this because it's uh, very interesting. This tension between uh, written and uh, spoken forms. Uh, 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 but uh, pointing out alternatives uh, for the real Frisian words uh, is important. So what are the challenges for the futures? Well, and I sum up the talk here, in fact. Frisian mainly functions as a spoken language. Writing is in Dutch. Frisian is still vital and attractive, also among youngsters. Look at WhatsApp, SMS. Educational system was, is, and will stay Dutch dominant. Will never change and Frisian is not linked to strong nationalism. Writing tools are only used by a very small group. They are, we have the technological developments, globalization, urgent societal <coughs> needs like for healthcare, and we have a status as second official language. So we have to give some advice, and I started already doing it two years ago uh, for a renewed language policy from a non-Frisian outsider, but from a researcher. And I uh, had a whole paper, and what was my advice? Native speakers of Frisian speak Frisian with young children from birth. More attention and resources for spoken Frisian. Accept variation, change and Dutch influence, and invest in language in speech technology. And I would like to add, involve young Frisian and accept the different roles. 
of Dutch and Frisian. They were in my newspaper uh, article, but they were integrated. Well, what were the reactions on this? A lot of positive ones. People came up to see me, but a silent my, uh, majority, but heavy negative ones. A small group, mainly writers, by the way, and activists, who I have to admit are bad readers, because I never claim that we have to ban writing uh, or stop support for writing. Uh, uh, they say written language is the most important. These reactions were mainly on Facebook. No one came to see me to enter the debate, and I invited them in the paper to have a debate. No one reacted. And they even started smear campaigns, but that's for the coffee break. So conclusion is that we need dynamic language policies for every language user, tailor fit to changing situations. And always accept as a policymaker that some people will always disagree and be unhappy. Uh, and scientific foundation, uh, research is foundation for such uh, language policy and modern language tools. So what do you need here? Well, you have it already. So uh, a Basque language academy, generous, uh, and what you need more is even more generous governmental support, I think, linked and supported by the Basque society, linked to the academic uh, world for research and education, and open to new ideas. So, tige dank.